The eyewitness accounts and histories of encounters with unidentified flying objects, or as we normal people call them, UFOs, have fascinated humanity for decades, sparking both a lot of skepticism, but also a lot of curiosity concerning if these things actually exist or not. With the new information that just came out that feels like it's just straight up a distraction from everything else at this point in mind, it seems kind of to fall in line with a lot of people either believe it or they don't care or they don't believe it and they don't care. Now it may just be skepticism as to why they're choosing to mention the existence at this point, but regardless, it is kind of a big deal. So among the numerous UFO cases that have captured public attention, the Travis Walton abduction stands out as one of the most compelling incidents that, again, prior to being told about the organic, or excuse me, yeah, organic non-human life forms or whatever they tried to call them, it's aliens, dude, but it would seem to help prove that these things are out there. In 1975, Travis Walton, a young logger from Arizona, claimed to have been taken aboard a UFO during a chilling encounter that has since taken a hold of the imagination of anyone who believes in UFOs to those who think he might just be huffing from the two cycle that came out back with them. The Travis Walton testimony and the case has elicited quite a range of emotions from people who absolutely believe that this is authentic and true to those who just say, there's a reason you told us this and it's because you want something. And we'll come to find out that that's kind of partially true. The Travis Walton abduction remains a rather strange encounter that sticks out to those trying to put together any evidence of extraterrestrial contact while also drawing many to poke holes in the event and just outright say it didn't happen. This encounter, also known as the Fire in the Sky incident, occurred on November 5th, 1975 in Sitgreaves National Forest near Snowflake, Arizona. At the time, the 22-year-old logger was working with a crew of six other men, including his close friend Mike Rogers. What would transpire that evening would become one of the most controversial UFO abduction cases in history. Granted, viewing it through a lens of recent information, I mean, maybe it really did happen. Potentially, a lot of people are about to be vindicated on what happened to them or at least what they say happened to them. But before moving on, I do want to thank you guys for watching and supporting the channel. Been covering aliens a lot lately, the whole world seems to be, but the support has been awesome and I'm glad that you guys are actually enjoying this side channel as much as you are. As always, uh, if we can get the channel up to a million subscribers by 2027, I will go hunt the Michigan Dogman. And if you would like to see something covered, drop it down below, but let's get to it. On the day of the encounter, the crew had been working quite hard, clearing the trees in the forest. With that said, I always imagined Arizona nothing but a giant desert. Uh, perhaps the most mind-blowing part about this whole thing is now I know that not only is there a forest out there, but such a large forest that you can use it for legitimate resources such as logging. It was Wednesday 5th, 1975, and it was thought to just be another regular workday for 22-year-old Travis Walton. Little did he know that he would have the experience of a lifetime getting in that truck and heading down the mountain. After a long day of work at the Apache Sitgraves National Forest, Travis and his logging crew of six were riding home when suddenly they noticed a brilliant glow peeking through the trees. As they continued riding down the dirt road, they eventually got close enough and then realized the light was emanating from a structured craft. Before the truck came to a complete stop and mesmerized by what he saw, Travis leapt out of the truck to approach the unidentified object as it hovered silently in the clearing. And that is pretty much showing you this man has no self-preservation. Within moments of his approach, Walton was struck by a vibrant bluish-green beam of light that seemingly came from the bottom of the craft and sent him flying backwards several feet. It was just straight-up radiation. Tough break. The immense beam lit up the entire force brighter than daylight. The witnesses have compared the beam a bolt to, like, lightning or a long blue flame. Travis never saw the beam. In a panic, the crew boss and the driver of the truck, Mike Rogers, fled the scene heroically as quickly as possible. The crew was utterly baffled as to what they had just witnessed with no earthly explanation. Minutes later, the crew decided to return to the site to help Travis, heroically, if they could. Much to everyone's surprise, Travis was gone. The crew looked for several minutes but could not find him anywhere. With seemingly no other hope, the crew then drove into town and contacted the local sheriff. They explained that what they had witnessed as best as they could and told authorities that a flying saucer had taken their friend Travis Walton. In an effort to prove them wrong, the sheriff conducted a thorough search of the area along with Mike Rogers, but they could not find him. In the days Walton was missing, all six of his co-workers were accused of murder. With no other explanation, Mike Rogers and the rest of the crew stuck to their story. As far as they were concerned, they witnessed a UFO shoot a beam at Travis and knock him to the ground before he suddenly vanished minutes later. Very little is known about what happened after Travis was struck. This portion of the story relies on Travis's memory and the rest of his incredible experience as revealed as results of regression hypnosis, which uh, we've uh, definitely talked about that before and it's never good. Local law enforcement were initially pretty skeptical and likely asked if these men were huffing too many fumes off their chainsaws. Not wanting to immediately react to the crew's extraordinary claim, they suspected that they might be involved in a hoax or a tragic accident that they were attempting to cover up. Granted, this type of story would draw more suspicion rather than just alleviating any. If you really want to throw the feds off your tracks, 
Say he was eaten by like a bear or cougar. All that said, the crew members panic and fear were evident and the search party was organized to locate Travis. Over the course of the next five days, a massive search operation was conducted involving law enforcement, volunteers, and even the US Forest Service. But despite their best efforts, much like those that seem to go missing for no particular reason in state parks and federal lands, they're just never seen again. No trace of Travis Walton would be found. Then, on the sixth day, Travis would reappear, disoriented and emaciated at a gas station in Heber, Arizona, approximately 30 miles from the abduction site. He recounted a harrowing tale of being taken aboard the UFO, where he claimed to have encountered beings unlike any he had ever seen before. Depictions of these beings varied, but Travis recalled seeing bald humanoid figures with large dark eyes. According to Walton's account, he had undergone medical examinations while on board the craft, though he could not recall much of these specific procedures. It was definitely anal probing. I would make sure not to recall that either. His next memory after the beam of light struck him was waking up on a deserted highway near the gas station. Despite the return of Travis, his claims were met with some being interested, but a lot wondering if maybe there was a much more mundane reason that he ended up where he was. Many in the UFO community saw his account as compelling evidence of extraterrestrial contact, while others dismissed it as a hoax or a product of hallucinations. Hallucinations potentially brought on by the fact that these men were up alone in the woods, cutting down trees all day, and may have gotten into something that they shouldn't have so that they continued to work. The case garnered significant media attention, drawing headlines and sparking heated debates across the nation. Various investigations were conducted, including polygraph tests administered to the crew members, which reportedly showed no signs of deception. Some, however, criticized the methodology and reliability of the polygraph tests, which some would be me. Now, biologically speaking, there is something known about polygraph tests that a lot of people do not seem to understand. First, the big one. Polygraph tests are not admissible in court. A lot of people seem to think that if you fail one of these things, then you're guilty. But the actual efficacy of these things is around like 50 to 60 percent, although it is claimed to be around 80 to 90 percent. And that is quite the discrepancy. When you take a polygraph test, here's how it works. It's based on your physiological responses. If you have a heart rate spike along with blood pressure at that point in time, it is considered a lie because lying may unintentionally raise your heart rate. The issue is if you have someone who is actively trying to skew results, they can think about lying while answering questions truthfully, which in turn can affect the results, like asking where they live or their name or what sort of dog they have. By raising heart rate and blood pressure, this can become their baseline, which in turn, when they do lie, there is no notable difference. On top of that, even if you tell the truth, you may misinterpret the question, which in turn can lead you to have a physiological response, which still counts as a lie. The point is, actually these things really aren't all that accurate, and that's why they aren't admissible in courts as being, oh, well, you know, this thing, and it's funny because you hear all the time, they're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm willing to take a polygraph test over something. And that's why investigators really don't care if you take a polygraph that much. Some do, most don't. And I think it's a form of ignorance, I guess is the best way. Not ignorance like, oh, you're ignorant, but ignorance in the sense of like, you just don't know that polygraphs actually kind of suck. But this means that if you're ever on the Murray show or Maury show, whatever you want to call it, and you are not the father, a DNA test is a great follow-up because sometimes it's just straight up not actually on point with the information. But these men have taken the test, and taken this test in particular, but it does not prove that they were or were not lying. But also, it doesn't prove that they were telling the truth either. You should be careful in believing polygraph tests in general for all the reasons cited. But moving on. Even though almost 48 years at this point have passed, these abductions remain an absolutely bizarre case with no conclusive evidence to definitively prove or disprove the events as described by Walter. Walton and his crew. It may have been an actual encounter with extraterrestrial beings, but it also is entirely possible it was just an elaborate ruse meant to cover something else up. No matter which, however, the actual event as detailed is little more than just a strange account based on Travis himself and those that were with him. The testimonies of the men that were with Travis at this time would be collected and then they would try to figure out from here if there were any holes that could be poked in the story as far as, oh, this guy's lying because of this or this guy's lying because of that. Essentially, it's, uh, it's pretty important to do that because you might have somebody that cracks. The first man was the testimony of Alan Davis. Alan would go over what he remembered before turning tail and running. After the bright light struck Travis, we were all in shock and didn't know what to do. We didn't want to stay there and risk getting hurt too, so we drove back to Snowflake to get help. 
We were worried, sick about Travis, and couldn't believe what just happened. The next man they would talk to is a man by the name of Kenneth Peterson, who was also one of the crew members. When we got back to Snowflake, we immediately went to the sheriff's office to report what had happened. It was hard for them to believe our story, and they thought that we might be just playing a prank on them or trying to cover up an accident. But we were adamant about what we saw and experienced. Essentially, the thing to know is that these men all had a very similar story about what they saw, and it's what I pretty much have already told you. From here, the sheriff would give his own testimony, and according to him, we received a call from the crew reporting that one of their members had disappeared after an encounter with a UFO. Naturally, we were skeptical at first, but the fear and distress in their voices were apparent. We organized a search party and scoured the area for several days but found no signs of Travis. Now, that's all well and good, and it's great to hear from the people who booked it out of there or weren't involved at all, but more importantly, what about the guy who actually went through the whole thing? Travis says that he blacked out for a moment after the beam hit him. He says he felt a numbing shock that then just went completely unconscious. The next thing he remembered was waking up while lying flat in an oddly shaped room. Travis says that he opened his eyes and he suddenly noticed three humanoid creatures standing over him. Walton recalls a strange device being placed over his chest, holding him down to the table. Startled by this, Travis got up and grabbed an object to defend himself from the odd creatures. He waved it around at an attempt to threaten them. Travis described the creatures as being between four foot to five foot tall with pale skin and enlarged heads. So obviously complete nerds that he should have just gone ape mode on and he would have been totally fine. Humanity number one. They had large brown eyes and were wearing orange jumpsuits, which that's a little odd. I'm not going to lie to you, but Travis's description of these beings is similar to that of others. One of the three creatures left the room, probably go get the uh, tranquilizer dart, and Travis curiously walked around the craft. He soon found himself in a room that resembled a planetarium. Then, two more human-looking beings in blue jumpsuits approached Travis and transported him elsewhere. Travis believes he was transported out of the scout ship that he was taken in and into another craft. He remembers those beings putting on a mask-like device over his face that caused him to black out. But beyond on that, he remembers very little. Other UFO investigators at this point would begin to weigh in to see if this was actually true or not, with some believing and some being highly skeptical of these events. One such skeptic, I guess you could call him, was Philip Class. As these crazy stories would surface, investigators would be brought in an effort to figure out what was true and what was just completely made up. This man, again class, states that I investigated the Travis Walton case extensively and I'm convinced that it was an elaborate hoax orchestrated by the crew. There are numerous inconsistencies with their testimonies and the polygraph tests they passed are not reliable indicators of truthfulness. The crew members changing accounts of the events cast doubts on the authenticity of the claims. And that's the biggest issue. If you start changing your account after the fact, that means you're probably lying. But then there were others that just totally believed them, and this one was Dr. James Harder. As a UFO researcher, I find the Travis Walton case compelling and significant evidence of extraterrestrial contact. Which, okay, the evidence here is basically just what people are saying, because as we will come to find out, there was no evidence actually gotten together for this. It's just based on people talking. But the witnesses' emotional reactions and their consistency to their accounts under the hypnosis support the authenticity of their experiences. And this is why nobody takes this stuff seriously. You cannot use hypnosis as a way because you, your suggestibility goes off the freaking charts when you undergo hypnosis. And by the way, the problem with hypnosis to begin with is it doesn't work on people with strong will. It works on people who are already suggestible and can succumb, I guess, to the hypnosis, which then I'm just saying you can ask leading questions and make people say whatever you want if they're under hypnosis. But while some skeptics try to dismiss the case, the evidence points to something beyond conventional explanations. And again, this is based on nothing. They have no evidence. Now, don't get me wrong. I love a good alien story. I do, and I'm pretty sure based on what we've just heard, it is a definite possibility that there are aliens out there, but again, you cannot just believe everything you hear. So one of the primary criticisms leveled against the Travis Walton abduction case is the claim that this was just an elaborate hoax orchestrated by Walton and his logging crew. Skeptics would argue that the crew fabricated the entire story to gain attention and profit from media coverage, or possibly just even simply prank him John to the public. We have never heard of loggers ever pranking people, so I'm sure that can't happen. But one of the largest issues, however, is the complete lack of concrete physical evidence to support the abduction claims that that fuels these suspicions. Critics question whether financial incentives played a role in perpetuating the alleged hoax. Some argue that by gaining attention and notoriety through the UFO abduction story, the logging crew members could potentially secure book deals, 
movie rights, or speaking engagements, which would be financially rewarding. And if you go on Google right now and you type in Travis Walton, you will find several shows discussing this, books being written, and basically everything that would financially incentivize the entire group. Or is it possible that something strange did happen, but it didn't go down the way that it was stated to? Another point of contention lies in the inconsistencies amongst the testimonies provided by crew members. To me, this is where the story begins to take a huge hit, and the financial aspect may come more into view with why this happened in the first place. Skeptics argue that the differing details amongst the stories, even though they were relatively similar in their accounts, cast doubt on the authenticity of the events. Critics assert that if the abductions were a genuine experience, the witnesses' recollections should have been more consistent and coherent. Yet as time went on, differences in recollection began to crop up from timing to the event itself that took place just after. While the crew members passed polygraph tests conducted shortly after the incident, skeptics point out, again, the reliability of polygraph results suck, especially in UFO abduction cases. All of those are questionable because it's all emotion. Polygraph tests are not infallible and can be influenced by factors also such as stress, anxiety, or even the skill of the examiner themselves. Based on if you ask the question a certain way, it can inspire physiological responses in another person's body. Critics argue that the Travis Walton case may have been influenced by also popular culture and science fiction of the time. The early 1970s saw a surge in UFO-related media and books which could have subconsciously affected the crew's perception and memories, leading them to construct a narrative consistent with prevailing UFO lore. Now, the flip side of that is why was there a surge in popular culture and science fiction at this time about aliens? Now, you can bring it back to around the 50s in Roswell, and then from there it continued on, but all of this happened after we detonated a nuke. If you would like to know my conspiracy theory on it, I believe that if you are traveling through the universe and you're just having a good time and you come across a planet that has life on it, if it just looks like there's a bunch of animals down there and there's not really an interesting species, or maybe they're just playing with like literal fire, like building fires, it's not really going to be something that you care about, right? You're just going to move on. But after that species splits an atom, you might be like, huh, okay, well, they've moved on from rubbing two sticks together to literally splitting atoms. Maybe we should keep an eye on this. And this obviously, Roswell happened after the uh, nuclear bombs were detonated in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's interesting that there was this surge in the 1970s to begin with. But people who did not believe this happened in the first place would propose psychological explanations for the alleged abduction experience. They suggest that the crew members might have experienced a group hallucination, mass hysteria, or sleep-related phenomena such as sleep paralysis, which can create vivid and surreal experiences. Now, the issue with this is is a group hallucination, uh, a sleep-related phenomena, they were driving the truck, right? Everybody there would have to have a sleep paralysis dream, which sleep paralysis dreams are not that common. And then on top of that, they would all have to have the same one, which does not seem like that would happen. A group hallucination likely isn't the case either, because unless they were on something and all discussing it and convincing one another, which that may be possible, but eh, I kind of doubt that. But mass hysteria, humans do mass hysteria sometimes. It, it, we're very social and this can happen. Or possibly the dominating personality in the group said something happened and then the less dominating personality is like, oh yeah, that definitely happened and they just haven't said anything. But one of the biggest issues that is essentially discussed in this entire thing is just the absence of tangible physical evidence to support the abduction claim. This would arguably be important for anything. I could argue uh, that I could fly, but if you don't see evidence of this, then you're unlikely to believe me. This issue would become compounded by despite like extensive searches of the abduction site and surrounding areas and also looking into Travis's physiology and his health, no trace of a UFO or any extraterrestrial presence or medical examinations or anything would be found. Not even radiation signatures or flattened vegetation like in the Rendlesham Forest incident, which if you would like to see a video on that, actually I did cover that. Critics argue that a genuine encounter with advanced extraterrestrial beings should have left some form of traceable evidence. The beam that knocked Travis down appeared to have at least some force behind it, right? Ergo, it should have left something behind, yet there is nothing. Critics point out that memories can be influenced and distorted over time, especially when subjected to hypnosis, which was used in some investigations of this case. Hypnosis may lead to the creation of false memories and confabulations, potentially affecting the accuracy of witnesses' recollections. The Travis Walton abduction case has faced significant skepticism and criticism since its inception. While UFO enthusiasts view it as evidence of extraterrestrial contact, people who don't believe it would argue that it's likely just a hoax or byproduct of psychological or social factors. The lack of concrete evidence, inconsistencies within testimonies and the potential for financial gain have all contributed to the enduring controversy surrounding this UFO or at least alleged UFO encounter. So despite these extensive investigation, the polygraph tests, 
the hypnosis, which again, does not actually do much of anything. The Travis Walton case was notable just for its lack of evidence supporting the abduction claims. The search efforts yielded no trace of a UFO, of any material evidence that could definitively link the incident to extraterrestrial encounters. Critics pointed the absence of this to be significant weakness in the case's credibility. The case has several things going for it, but I think personally more things going against it. The first huge nail in the coffin is the simple fact that, again, there's nothing that supports this even happened. Despite extensive investigations in the area, as well as questioning the people involved, while the stories may be a little similar, there were changes to it and then nothing was left behind. Then we had the issue itself of the money made and the fame achieved after the story was leaked. It's not too far-fetched to believe that a few men just drove Travis out to an area that he would stay at, drive back into town, make up the story only to have Travis reemerge on the sixth day near highway claiming it was aliens so that nobody went to jail. The whole thing just seems odd to me. The missing time is also another issue because around this time, Travis basically said the same thing that everyone else was saying, catching the same wave to fame with it. And I mean, also along with that, why would this coworker just not grab him and help him when he was put down on the ground? To me, it just seems a little too perfect. And also he remembers just enough to tantalize everyone, but not enough to put himself where he was, how he got onto the highway, what he really saw, or why he ended up where he was. Overall, do I believe the story? Not really. It seems like the more I cover this stuff, the more I see in other instances that there was like reputable people with something to lose if they mentioned anything and there was evidence left over. With these guys, it was a group of loggers in the woods who seemingly could not produce anything or any evidence that would indicate that they saw what they did and I'd be more inclined to believe them if there was just something to go off of, but there's not. And because of the issues with polygraph tests as well as hypnosis in general, not giving a concrete definitive answer because it can actually falsely implant kind of memories into your head. I think this one is just a complete hoax with a few men who were really committed to it because they have achieved their fame. Why go against something that's actually just actively working? But I wanna hear what you guys think. Do you think this was just completely bogus or do you think it could have happened? Truth be told, with the congressional hearings about aliens being real, maybe someday we can just straight up ask the species if they really did it. Why were they wearing orange and blue jumpsuits? I have no idea. It would be quite hilarious to see if like an alien species confirms stories about them and then just outright say to others, yeah, that didn't happen. Might make a lot of people look foolish, but until that time, I appreciate you guys watching the video. If you enjoyed, leaving a like would be great and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. But all right, that's gonna do for me. I hope everyone enjoyed and we'll see y'all in the next one.